You're listening to Blast Podcasting, episode 13. Evangelion Talk. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Blast Podcasting. I'm Xander. And this is Anthony. Holy shit, dude. This is going to be crazy. Yeah, this is going to be a really interesting episode. Um, it, yeah, we kind of let a little Easter egg out on the, our last episode when we were talking about Godzilla, uh, King of Monsters, that we were going to be covering an anime that uh, is one of Robin, the, the late Robin Williams, one of his favorite animes of all time. And uh, mm-hmm. before before we get into that, Anthony, uh, how you been? Like, there's There's been a lot going on with... Uh, "Quote unquote nerd culture slash and slash pro wrestling." Uh, you told me some really interesting pro wrestling news yesterday. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of what's interesting is going on is going to cause me to rant later on in the episode because a lot of it has to go with Evangelion. Because the reason we're doing this is the Netflix thing. So exactly, you know. So we'll we'll get into that later when we get into the Evangelion because I have some ranting to do today. But the one thing I do want to say is this. The big wrestling news, we, well, we have an AEW show tonight as of this recording free, which I think you're going to watch too, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to try to check it out, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, I, you just go on the BR live, but by the time this is over, it'll be on there. You can watch if you missed it live, but I'm going to watch it live, and it's free. Um, the big news is WWE, they've been in a slump lately, okay? And... The way I follow wrestling for me is I have WWE Network, so I don't watch Raw or SmackDown regularly. I watch pay-per-views. Yeah. I watch every pay-per-view they do, which is easier because if you really think about it, there's like – that's five hours of wrestling every week. Yeah. Plus NXT, if you watch NXT, which I don't. I've heard, I've been told I should. 205 Live, which is the cruiserweight division, right? Mm-hmm. There, that's probably like 10 hours of wrestling plus any other content they show plus if you watch wrestling in general there's new japan and ring of honor and uh impact you know and that's a lot of other wrestling then we have aew in the fall so i mean what can you do right there's so much wrestling but right now there's big shifts in the wrestling world and wwe has been in the process of has been in the process of has been in the process of, uh, you know, just a change because of AEW and independent wrestling. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? Well, WWE's ratings have been slumping. So they hired Paul Heyman, who was the founder of ECW. Well, he's been working with them because he's the voice for Brock Lesnar. You knew that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But they hired him as as the creative guy in charge of... Monday Night Raw, the big news is they got Bischoff back in as, as an executive role. Now, he did work for WWE back in the early 2000s after WCW folded, about a year. But he was not a creative guy. He was just an on-screen talent. Right, yeah. Because they were for trying to... Three, yeah, because they were trying to do the whole, like, WCW, WWE, like, E thing for a little bit, for a hot minute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he wasn't, but now he's in the creative role. And what's going to happen is they're going to be in charge and they're supposed to change the creative direction. The skepticism that everybody has is Vince McMahon is too much of a control freak. Oh, yeah, it's it's legendary that McMahon will throw out scripts at the last minute and all that shit. And if you really want confirmation of this, go listen to Chris Jericho's podcast interview with John Moxley, the former Dean Ambrose from the end of May. I, I suggest you listen to that too, Xander, if you get a chance. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because he, you know, he left for AEW, and, man, he really tears up the WWE. Only thing concerning about John Moxley, though, is his wife still works with WWE. So I don't oh, know how well that's going. But anyway, um, that's that's my concern. How do you feel about the news? I, I, think, I think it's kind of interesting, and something I was thinking about when you first told me the news is, you know, there are young – uh, pro wrestling fans. I'm not talking about young, like in their teens. There's pro wrestling fans that are in their 20s right now that did not grow up during the Attitude Era of wrestling. Isn't that kind of insane to think about? Yeah, that's a, it, that is insane. That's 
my big viewership when I watched that. And Attitude Era isn't just WWE. It's also what was going on in WCW. Yeah. And I was really big into WCW because I know a lot of people put down a lot of their decisions, and rightly so, but I really thought the storylines in WCW at some time, at, at times were more intriguing than the storylines in WWE. So yeah. what I mean by, th by that is I like wrestling, and I'm a science fiction fantasy nerd. You could do that. But I'm kind of I well, I don't mind supernatural elements to a degree, mm -hmm. you know. But I prefer sometimes the grounded storylines like the NWO and all that, and even with Sting back in the day. That care that storyline with Sting is one of the best character development stories of all time for wrestling. Yeah, really, it really is, and it's it's just interesting that we're gonna see uh, what was. For a, for a while, like a, a decade of kind of just staleness of pro wrestling, kind of blossoming into a resurgence with Paul Heyman, Eric Bischoff. Uh, you know, like I said, wrestling fans that only heard about the Attitude Era that maybe went back and watched the WWE Network and saw some of the old matches and some of the old stories and documentaries, seeing that kind of blossom and also seeing what AEW has to offer for pro wrestling fans. It's it's a really interesting time for uh, folks who enjoy that sports entertainment, you know? I'll, t I'll tell you this, too. If you want to watch some really good wrestling, the thing about WWE Network is it's not just old WWE stuff. They've got ECW and WCW, and they have WCW going back to the 80s, which back then it was part of the National Wrestling Alliance, old NWA stuff. I've been watching NWA stuff lately, and holy shit, that stuff is good, but it's brutal. I mean, people yeah. bleed a lot in those matches. Um, one of the bloodiest pay-per-views is Starcade 1985. Yeah. But watch it. It's one of the best pay-per-views, Starcade 1985. And, I mean, that's really when you see, like, Dusty Rhodes and, and Ric Flair. The thing about Ric Flair is I wouldn't say he was at his prime, but that's really when he was his prime as a heel. I, yeah. Not as a heel, but when he was really coming into it. Because I do – a lot of people praise his run during the NWO era as he was still a piece of shit, but not as big of a piece of shit as the NWO. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing about the – I could go on for that. We'll talk about we'll, – hopefully we could get our wrestling buddy in again. Yeah. Because we really need to. Yeah. We need to get Corkamo on because, like you said earlier before before we did a show, the pre-show, that uh, he – he he we need his input on, on the changes of wrestling because it's definitely changing right now. It's a, it's a big shift. It is a big fucking shift. So – yeah, that's me it, for wrestling. Real quick, too, on my game, because I know you want to talk about a certain game, I think, a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am going through, and I'll probably talk more about this on Absolute Counter. Mm -hmm. we'll, I think we'll have a whole episode down the line. Um, I've been playing Trolls of Cold Steel, and that is a hell of an RPG. I know you sold your copy of it. Not yet. It's still Not on yet. eBay. It's still on eBay. Hopefully someone will buy it. <laughs> but you should download it. Yeah, because it is one of the best RPGs in the, I've played. With with well, story wise, there's some issues I have with the UI a little bit, and I'm not a fan of the English <laughs> of uh, dub, which you know I've complained mm -hmm. about. Um, which we'll talk more about people complaining about English dubs later on. Oh yeah, but uh, in the end, um, Trails of Cold Steel One is a great game. I have two loaded on here, and I bought uh, because of the Steam sale. I bought Trails in the Sky and Trails in the Sky 2, which I've heard is just as good storyline. And they all take place in the same world. So there's characters that cross over and shit. Yeah, like uh, I've had Trails of Cold Steel, the Lionheart edition on PS3. I've had it for years. Uh, it was just one of those things that I bought at GameStop during my tax returns. I had some more money in my pocket. Mm -hmm. and I saw a collector's edition. I'm like, oh, yeah, it's Falcom. I, I'm going to check this out. And... It was funny because it actually came with a slip cover for Trails of Cold Steel Two, so you would have like the whole you would have the set at the time when the when the second one was coming out. But yeah, the game is still sealed. I never actually played, but I've heard good things over the years. I've heard you talk about it, and uh, yeah, like it's it's been your your big game right now. Every time we talk about games, you're like Trials of Cold Steel, man. <laughs> yeah, that's why I haven't bought Bloodborne or even Mario Maker Two because I have Trails of Cold Steel Two, but. I think what I don't want to get burned out. So because my I clean out my PS4, did I tell you that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's running great now, 
and I think I'm going to tackle RE2. Yeah, you should. It's Finally. it's one of the best remakes but, ever. But I will tell you this. If you get Trails of Cold Steel, make sure you get the PS4 editions. Yeah. Because that, they come with all the DLC. Oh, go ahead. That, yeah, that's why I was like, I don't really feel bad selling the PS3 special okay. edition that I have. I don't feel bad because I'm like, you know, there's more definitive versions out there. And uh, if I want to tackle it, I want to I want to have the whole main course. You know, I, I want all the fixings. I just don't want to, you know, play the, the vanilla version. So, yeah. And think about this. Three and four are PS4 only. And those games, you do make some choices in them that carry over to oh, the next yeah. games. Wow. So. So PS1, PS4, I mean, um, you want to get those two because we got three coming out in September, and I know there's some big releases, but fuck every game. It's three for me. If I, I'm pretty sure two's good. I've heard two's is even better. But that's the crazy thing about these Trails games is they're episodic, long-ass fucking games, and it made me think about the Final Fantasy VII remake, which, you know, if... I don't care if the whole chapter is Midgard. If it's as meaty in character development as this fucking one game is, which it is fucking meaty in character development and characterization, getting to know the characters, fine by me. Because this proves episodic gaming can be done right, especially long-ass episodes. Definitely, definitely. Uh, when, when it comes to games, a uh, game I've been playing that I definitely want to uh, talk about before we get into the main topic, it's, of course, I've been playing Bloodstained Ritual tonight. Uh, I've been playing the quote unquote gimped version on the Nintendo Switch, and this is where <laughs> this is where my rant's gonna come in because okay, I I've seen so many people talk about the Switch version, which I will say first and foremost it does have flaws. It is not okay. It is not a perfect port. Uh, it does have some problems that are being addressed by. Uh, the folks behind Bloodstain, Igarashi, and all the developers are looking into it, and they're going to be fixing patches. Uh, the main thing is the game. The game has some details that aren't as apparent in the PS4 and Xbox One. Uh, like the beginning of the game, you're on a ship. There's not as ma many uh, water effects when you first start the game. It, it, they take some of the stuff out of the background in the Switch version. Uh, the frame rate is at 30 instead of 60. But the main thing that everyone's been talking about is how this game is just not playable. It is terrible. And I'm like, have you played oh, the Switch shit. version? And they're like, no, no, this is just something I've heard from IGN. I'm like, okay, so you're going to follow a website that gave Pokemon a 7.5 <laughs> because of too much water. You're going to follow that, <laughs> but you're not going to listen to people who have actually played that fucking port and say, hey, it's really not that bad. Uh, I've played over 10 hours now. I've about got... 40% of the of the castle explored, and I haven't had any issues. I've had a little bit of slowdown, but then again, the PS4 and Xbox One also have had slowdown in the same amount of areas. Like I said, it's not perfect. It's going to be addressed. It's going to be patched, but it's not nearly as unplayable as some folks try to bring it out. And that brings back to another thing that I want to say that's very controversial, is that I love patches. I love updates. A lot of folks do not mm -hmm. like patches, and they will complain. They're like, oh, it makes me so mad that you know a game comes out and it's not finished, and they have to update and fix it. You know, These are the same people who complain when a game's delayed, and they're the same kind of people when games come out and they're flawed and they have defects. We live in a time now... Preach it, motherfucker! Yeah, we live in a time that game developers are you know, being hospitalized, like what we've been hearing about with the new Pokemon uh, Sword and Shield. Uh, some of the developers have actually been hospitalized from being overworked to put out a product. We have this, and then we have the the gamers who are just like I, I like to call freaking passenger drivers. They've never developed a game in their life. They've never worked in the industry other than paraphrasing what some YouTuber is paraphrasing off of a gaming site, and that's all it is. And it pisses me off. I'm just like it, it's it's crazy, you know. Well, one, let me address something. People act like patches are a brand new thing. They date back all the way to the mid-90s. Yeah. They do. PC gaming. And you know what? Patches, when people say they hate patches, it's one of those things like saying, I hate video games. Yeah. You know, it's so general. Because patches don't just fix things. They add things. They do. They change stuff. Look at like what Tekken 7 did with its patches. 
not yeah. only did it allow you to do the DLC, if you play Tekken 7 at launch, like well, or close to launch like I did, and you play it now, the menu screen, like the menu screen for all of that is completely different than what it used to be. Yeah. Because they patched that up. Um, it's just one of those things where look at the oh, let's I, I'll give you a good example of a patch that that is good. And I agree, I'm with you on patches. Remember the Xbox 360 patches? Oh yeah. When remember when they changed the blades? Yeah. To that Xbox, that new UI, that completely different UI that was pretty cool, but kind of slowed down your 360. Mm -hmm. But then they added a patch that fixed that. Yeah, it's the same shit, right? Yeah, I mean, and then the thing is, is a lot of people will say, "Oh, you know, games back in the day they were complete and they were so much better." No, they weren't, because we say you got a game like Ninja Gaiden on the NES. That <laughs> game, that game has flaws. Could you it imagine? Does. Could you imagine if like they had the technology we have now, and they could like go back and fix some of these NES games that were utter trash? The the problem with I love Ninja Gaiden, one of my favorite NES games, but I will say this: the problem with that game's difficulty is not only some bad design choices, but some glitchy shit like enemy respawns when you kill an enemy and then they respawn right away. That's yeah. not that's a bullshit fix. I mean, that's bullshit. That's why if, if you would reduce the enemy spawner or something like that, or not yet let it happen, that game would still be difficult, but not bullshit cheap. Yeah. And you're right. If you could patch that out, why not patch it? Exactly. Because, I mean, like I said, games games are expensive. They've always been expensive. And, you know, if there's a way that you can get more bang for your buck, because these are being made by human people, this, I mean, games are not developed by robots. And if they can fix something, that's awesome. I, I'm all about that. Even if you're the kind of person, like, I, I, I can understand the people that are like, you know what, I'm going to wait on buying the game until everything's patched. I'm like, okay, that's cool. But for the people that are just going out of their way and they're like, this is completely unplayable because this is what IGN told me. I'm like, shut up. Yeah, Let's exactly. Shut up. And let me tell you this. Remember all the jokes in the 90s about, oh, let's make another version of Street Fighter 2? Yeah. Those are patches. Yeah, they are. I don't care. They're, those are fucking patches. That, and yeah, those those were th that was freaking cartridge DLC right there. Exactly, those were patches. So, and and any version fighting games do this a lot. I mean, you know how many versions of fuck? I mean, I was looking at Mame and I have Killer Instinct, right? Yeah, I have version two point one, two point two, one point five. All of those games, Mortal Kombat even had 1.1, 1.2. You know, all those games had patches too. Some were more subtle, i.e. Mortal Kombat, Killer Instinct. Some weren't Street Fighter. But they're patches. And patches say, are good. Because, hell, even uh, Mortal Kombat 3. Oh, yeah. Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. Yeah. Com why, why do you think when Mortal Kombat games are re-released, they don't release Mortal Kombat 3? They release Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3. Yep. You know? Yep. And one other thing, you know, Street Fighter, the new challengers. Mm -hmm. You know that the reason they did the follow up, the the final, I guess the last version of that series for a long time, um, the, the turbo, Super yeah. Street Fighter 2 turbo, because new challengers was slower compared to hyper fighting. So they patched in something that people wanted. Yeah. Faster speeds. So there you go. What's wrong with patches? Nothing. Exactly, but yeah, that that was. Just There's my... been bad patches, but oh yeah. But go ahead, my but, bad. <laughs> that's all good. But that, that's pretty much what I wanted <laughs> to say. Uh, I've I've been enjoying Bloodstained. Uh, I plan on uh, talking more about it in a in a video very soon. That I'm gonna put all on the channel because I'm gonna make a video of, like games I've been playing, and that's gonna be one of the games I'll I'll talk about. But uh, but other than that, I mean. Um, Let's get into the, the meat and potatoes of this episode. And it's an anime that just debuted on Netflix. And here, here's the funny thing. This, this show is going to be really interesting because we're, we got two different perspectives. You have Anthony, who is a veteran of Evangelion. And then you have me, who have heard about the I've heard about this anime for years, but I never sat there and watched it because I've been I was I was very um, I, I want to say like overwhelmed and kind of, I was kind of like scared to get into it, 
like how mm-hmm. I do with some animes because sometimes you hear about anime so much you're like I don't know if I can tackle all this, but I started with the Netflix series. <laughs> So this this is going to be interesting because we're going to talk about it. And overall, I want to ask you, as a veteran, Anthony, what do you think about the Netflix reboot of um, Evangelion? I think it's fine. I know some people are going to be like, you're just a fanboy. Well, fuck you. Let me tell you something. Fly Me to the Moon, you know what was funny is, for those that don't know... The original, the series previously had the song Fly Me to the Moon, which I believe was written by Bart Carroll. Its most famous version was sung by Frank Sinatra, right? Right. But they did a version for the, of the song at the end of Evangelion, and then there's some sound cues with Fly Me to the Moon in yeah. the series. Well, for whatever reason, Netflix couldn't get it, and it upset people. And the excuse that I saw for the credits was the music is supposed to make you decompress after each fucking episode. Because the series is so fucked up. Yeah. And to be honest, it never did that for me. It's like, I want to see what the fuck is next, so I always skipped the... Cri- Who the fuck... Let me, I don't understand this either. Who the fuck watches end titles anyway? Do you? No. In anything. The, okay. only, the only time I would watch an end title uh, would be... I know some shows like like uh, Dragon Ball Super and like Baruto, uh, the, the series after Naruto and Shippuden, sometimes the end clips would show kind of foreshadowing of what to expect later on. But, yeah. but I mean, it's not that big of a deal. Like I've never been like, Oh, right. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta watch the ending credits to see if there's anything. I mean, it's not a fucking Marvel movie. Yeah. And, and with those previews, let me ask you this. They're, they're intact on dubs. And I used to like watching them cause you know, they were kind of cool, but nowadays I don't want to watch those because one, I have the next episode anyway, accessible. Mm-hmm. Unless yeah. it's a show that is like ongoing, so I can see what's going to happen next. That's different when it's ongoing and you're waiting for the next episode. But with something like Even Galleon, there's no point in watching it. Yeah. Especially, yeah. If, especially and, if you're going to binge watch it. And that's the thing with Fly Me to the Moon is... I'll admit, I was a little... like When I first saw that it wasn't gone, it kind of hit me a little bit. But it was like... And then I thought about it. Was like, is it really necessary? And now I got petitions and all kinds of bullshit. And I, I got further rants about this, about people complaining about this re-release. But that's for later on. But I will say, I like the re-release. What about you? I, I mean, I really don't have a whole lot to compare it to because I haven't really watched too much of it prior. Now I did watch some because, because I will admit. Like I told you before we record, this is going to be an anime I'm going to have to watch again because there's so much stuff that I, I could not process uh, just watching okay. it. Um, but I did watch a couple of YouTube videos of folks talking about the anime, and when they would talk about it, sometimes they would play clips of the old dub. And, and can I just say, like, Shinky, um, he, he kind of sounds a little bit like Kermit in the old dubs. Oh, Shinji? Yeah, he he, he sounds. You, you said Shinky. <laughs> Shinky, but no, Shinji. Uh, he he sounds kind of like Kermit a little bit. I was like, I was like, oh, like I kind of prefer the new dub a little bit. And here's the thing, like, uh, and and this is going to open up an Anthony rant right here, because I'm going to say it. A lot of the old dubs are not as good as folks remember. It's a lot of it's nostalgia. Um, oh yeah. A lot of a lot of old anime. If I have the choice between watching the old '90s dubs or I can watch the Japanese, um, you know, subtitles, I'd rather watch. Um, I'd rather watch it in Japanese because I feel like it captures it a little bit more. Because dubs back in the '90s, they weren't really that good. Uh, some of them are exceptions, but yeah, they some of them were just really really dry because. You know, voice acting was a different thing back then. It was just kind of like they'd find someone off the street, like, "Hey, you want to do a voice of this robot guy? Okay, come over here." You know, <laughs> right? So, yeah, <laughs> you're gonna open me up, right? Yeah, yeah, because because I know that's me, that's one of the rants. Let me explain something about this old dub. It's not good because those actors are bad. Those actors are actually quite good. The reason it's bad is it was one of their first jobs in the mid 90s for ADV. Spike Spencer is one of the best voice actors in anime and video games out there in my opinion. He's the original voice of Shinji. If you want to watch him voice Shinji really well, watch the rebuild films. That's fine. 
Even if they got this cast, the old cast back for a new Netflix stuff, I would have been okay with that because they've far improved. I'm just saying that original dub itself, not in the context of the actors, is trash. It's yeah. not the actors that – it was their first job. It's trash because it was their first job. Everyone's overacting. Um, the only actress I never liked in that was everyone loves Tiffany Grant's Oscar, and I don't know why. She sounds like a shrill – 40-year-old version. You know how bitchy Oscar is? Imagine a 40-year-old sounding shrill voice coming out of Oscar. Oh, wow. And the only reason some people like uh, give Tiffany Grant is she's fluent in... And she's a little bit more tolerable in the um, rebuild films. But the only reason some people like it is, as you know, uh, Oscar is part German, right? And she knows German. Ah. Tiffany Grant is fluent in German, so she actually improvised lines in the original dub in German, and people are like, oh, that's missing from the original actress. But the girl that they got in this one, I thought sounded perfect for Asuka. She yeah. sounds like a bratty... She sounds like a kid. She sounds like a bratty fucking kid. Yeah. I, 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 thought, I thought it was good. Like I said, I don't, I'm not having... Uh, huge comparisons like I didn't sit there and be like okay well let me because I know there's YouTube videos or like comparisons between the two dubs it doesn't matter to me as long as the, the story is cohesive and they did it justice of what the original was which I heard they, they changed a little bit of things to it as well they changed the script it's a more bit. literal yeah it's a more literal translation and the reason you can tell that this is my only pet peeve of it there's a little bit of English, and you probably know what I'm referring to. Third child. Third, yeah, so yeah, it should be third child, not fourth children. I don't know why they kept that. It's it's so weird hearing it. I because I've known about fourth children and third children for years. Because I know, you know, I've looked at, I've studied Evangelion for the year for years, and that's what they're referred to in Japan: fourth children, third children. Yeah. But. I don't, as, as an English major, I don't see any reason. Sometimes, you know, there's some Japanese words that can come across as like and love, and, you know, it's important in that choice. But with children, I don't see any contextual reason to keep it. Just change it to child. That's my only complaint. Yeah. That kind of bugged me a little bit. But other than that, I mean, the, the, the performances are better because they're much more subdued. The problem with the original dub is everyone's, like, screaming all the time, you know? They, I don't know if you yeah. noticed that, but everyone's so, like, loud. And I'm a loud guy myself. I can't really talk. But in that dub, everyone is fucking loud and exaggerated. In this one, it's much more subtle. It's much more subdued. Even she's a little bit more exaggerated. But when they do explode, it's more monumental, and it hits home. Like when uh, Masato gets mad and she blows up in the in the old one, she's always just so exaggerated. And that's funny because those same actors played more subdued versions of those characters in the rebuild films, which I'll explain to you later what those are. Yeah, but yeah, I like the new dub. I think the new dub is good. Can I? I have one more rant before we dive into the series. All right, one one more rant. There is this new rewriting. We've talked about how some people are poising, posing agendas into writing, you know, a lot. Yeah. Like when we talked about Iceman being gay. Yeah. In the last, in episode 24, and there's spoilers here, as usual, so, you know. Um, there's a, the last angel, Kara, right? Right. And for years it's been debated, is Shinji liking him in a homosexual way? Or is he liking him because someone is actually giving him the attention and care that nobody has ever done to him? And it's hard to say which. And it's been debated for years and for years and for years. But all of a sudden, because some lines were changed to the more literal translation, all of a fucking sudden, they're automatically gay now. No. You know what? All these people who are saying that they're automatically gay, that's never been the case. It's always been debated. They're acting like all of a sudden that that was definitive. No. It's been debated for years. I have followed this series since 2001, Xander. I have followed message boards. News, net, news sites, all kinds of stuff. And that's one of the things, of many things, that series has been debated about for the for years. Was the Karu and Shinji relationship is gay? I, for one, don't know. Okay? But now, because of, of the LGBTQ thing going on right now, people are pushing it as it was definitively that way, and it was never definitive. What was your take on that? Here's, here's the thing. Like, I, I knew about it from the controversy. Yeah. Because, like I said, I never watched the show before. So I knew about this whole thing because of the controversy on social media. But I'll be honest, watching it and knowing, being like, hey, is this guy gay or not, it did not change my overall 
consensus of what the show was to me. It did not change my relationship between those two people because it doesn't matter if they love each other, sexual or not. That was something that was very interesting in the sense of who Koji was and who uh, Sinji is. You know, being the the being an angel and getting the the love that he never got who he's been battling this whole series he's been battling these angels these monsters and he, the the one thing he got recognized and loved just freaking being the pilot of of the unit and the the, the evas he right. got he got that you know so i mean even talking about it, i get goosebumps cuz it like i said this this shows like a freaking it's like an onion it's got many layers so seeing that i was like oh, dude i got another I, yeah, I, I just. Oh, go ahead. I was gonna say it didn't bother me. Like I did, I, I, I didn't even think about it. You know. And, and and here's the thing about that. One can look at it at a different point of view. Shinji's sexuality is so challenged throughout that whole series. It really is. He doesn't know what he wants. I mean, there's that scene where he sees the naked Asuka, Masato, and Rei. And there's no clear cut love interest for him. He's so confused about sexuality. Because he's been so closed off. Yeah. So one can view the Karu thing as him conflicted about his sexuality and not a definitive answer. And of course, there's the infamous scene that opens up end of Evangelion, which you know I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, which we can talk about too because, you know, um, that even shows how much, that shows how pent up his sexuality is and how he doesn't even understand it. He doesn't understand what he's doing wrong in that scene, right? Yeah, I mean... But I don't want to talk too much. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, the guy doesn't even understand what love is to begin with uh, because, I mean, he has never had that sort of nurturing direction his whole life anyway because of his father. It, exactly. Think about it. And, and the scene we're talking about in the end of Evangelion, we might as well just say it, is the masturbation scene. Yeah. Where Shinji, he... He unclothes Asuka, and I don't think he's ever seen a nude woman, at least, and or a woman in that state of undress. And he's so inept on his sexuality that he masturbates over her, which is a creepy fucking thing for anyone to do. Yeah. And it's like, what the fuck? But you kind of get why he does it, because he's so pent up. He's pent up in every aspect that sexually he's probably even more screwed up. Yeah, I, I it was like so, one of the, it's one of those scenes like I saw it and I'm like, yeah, that's kind of fucked up. But at the same time, I was just kind of like, he he's kind of a fucked up guy to begin with, you know. It's it's okay. And then let, let's get into this for those who have <laughs> those okay. are wondering what Evangelion is. It's from from first glance, it's it's about you know these pilots that control these big robots. They're trying to stop these things called angels that are like these evil monsters from stopping the world from ending. That's pretty much the, the like from the first episode, like this is what this is. But by, by the time you're almost done with it, it becomes a almost exam on psychological fucked upness. <laughs> yeah, it is. It really does. It's it, Because I remember when I first watched the series, everyone's like, this is the most fucked up series. Those first set of episodes are like, what are they talking about? This is kind of, you know, like atypical. There's a funny little penguin and there's yeah. your nerdy little group of, Shinji has his little group of friends and, and all that. But then once you hit episode 15, the end of that, when mm -hmm. they showed the crucified Lilith, that's when everything starts to fucking change. Yeah. And if you rewatch the series, the one thing is, is as fucked up as it is, it's even with all that humor, it's always been there since the beginning. Yeah. You realize that after you watch it the first time, that's one thing. Like when you talk, when you watch it again, we don't have to make a whole show, but tell me the next time you watch it again, if you notice that, that how fucked up it is, even from the beginning. Yeah. Cause I mean, like the beginning of it, you know, it, it, it kind of made me think of uh, Robotech in the beginning of it. It's like, oh, this little boy, he's going to pilot this uh, robot mech, and he's he's the guy that's going to save the world. And, and you know, you think, running into anime stereotypes, that, okay, he he's a dork, he, he doesn't really have a whole lot of friends, but by in the anime, he's going to find himself, and he's going to become super badass. That does not happen in this show. <laughs> no, and think about it. What if 14-year-olds really have to be put in that situation? Yeah. As ludicrous as that situation sounds, 
you know, most animes are like, yeah, let's go. And and I don't mind the whole power fantasy aspect. There's a reason. Like, I hate when people criticize power fantasies to a degree, unless they're really bad ones. But who cares? We watch them because they're fantasies. We like to see that character become something that he possibly can. Evangelion, on the other hand, shows what piloting a robot can do and the abuse that you suffer from your father can do while fighting monsters. And Shinji is literally traumatized. Like, it's crazy. There's some fucked up things that the angels do. Like, if he sees the, like, when he first sees Unit 1's eye, remember? Yeah. He screams. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like in another anime, it'd be like, this, this is cool. But in that one, he, like, that's why he's damaged too. Like, he's already fucked up, but piling the Eva, Eva and the stuff he has to do fucks him up. Yeah. I mean, he even becomes liquefied juice at one point. <laughs> yeah, it, it gets it gets really, really crazy, and especially like you said after after episode fifteen, it takes it takes a different turn. And one of the things that you told me when we were you know talking about covering the show, you told me you know watch watch the the Netflix series and then watch the movie end of Evangelion. You were like, watch the end of that, and um, it's kind of interesting because. Here's my interpretation. Both endings are kind of the same, but they take different aspects. Where the end of the show is a psychological ending, and the end of even Evangelion is almost like an end of the things around them. If that makes any sense. One thing is they ran out of money for those last two episodes. Yeah, that's what I was. So the end of Evangelion. Yeah. yeah, end of Evangelion is the original planning. And what's funny is if you watch closely in the last two episodes, specifically episode 24, they show Misato's and Ritsuko's deaths exactly as they are in End of Evangelion. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, because there's real fast clips of showing Ritsuko, her body. Remember Gendo shoots her and she falls in the LCL? Yeah. Yeah, there's, they show a clip of that in episode 24, and they show Masato right before, you know, right after she gets mortally wounded protecting Shinji in that final episode, in that final movie. Mm -hmm. They show her lying there on the ground. So those that was the original ending. But one way, I like how you said they're both different aspects. The way I interpret it is this. The, for, the episode in the episode endings, this is how I interpret it. I think everything that happened outside of End of Evangelion happened in the movies because they showed Ritsuko and Misato's death. They just showed the mind shit that happens in the second half of End of Evangelion, right? Yeah. But what I think is in the ending, the congratulations ending, it's Shinji accepting instrumentality and end is him rejecting it. Yeah. Yeah, I could. I, yeah. Yeah, definitely. That's my, but it's not right because other people have had interpretations that that are just as good. But that's how I interpret it because Shinji is still in the instrumentality and everyone's congratulating him and he's becoming one with everyone as instrumentality. He's being accepted. In it, he rejects it knowing he's still going to get hurt in the outside world. And that last scene, which we should talk about later on, the, ch the strangling scene shows that. Oh, yeah, that strangling scene. I saw that. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Yeah, so it's like, yeah, but yeah, that's 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 my interpretation. Which ending did you like better, though? I, I like I like end of uh, Evangelion, the movie. Yeah, I, I like I, I like that ending a lot more. Well, next year we'll have a third ending. So, yeah, so that, that's what I was reading up on. I was reading up that it's still not over. You know, it's just kind of interesting. Here's the thing. Um, let's talk about rebuild real quick. Okay. The re the rebuild films, which I want, we'll do a whole show on those. Yeah, I'd, I definitely would need to check those out. But watch it after you at least watch Evan Galleon one more time. Um, mm -hmm. The rebuild series is a essentially it was announced in two thousand six, and they are a retelling of the series. I will tell you that the first movie, and specifically the first half of the first film, is a very abbreviated version of the first six. Far five episodes, and they're almost exactly scene by scene. Yeah. It takes a bit of a different turn in the in the second half, and it becomes a little bit different. And you remember the sniper scene in about episode six? The move, the first movie ends with that, but it's done differently. But it's still with that sniper scene. Remember with yeah. Shinji and Ray? 
mm-hmm. uh, shooting that like diamond angel, yeah, that thing. Um, but it's really with epi- with the second movie that it really takes a whole different approach, and uh, it really does. And then the end of the second movie, I'll give you a hint. It ends. Well, the it ends where the half of end of Evangelion happens, the, the oh, middle wow. of end of Evangelion. Yeah, certain. Do you mind if I say, it or do you want to wait? Yeah, to yeah, watch go, it? Go, yeah, go ahead. Okay, third impact happens at the end of the second film. Oh wow! And the the third film, which I've never seen, but I I, I do want to watch it. It takes place after third impact, and there's something called final impact. The other thing that happens too is uh, the other big change is there is a fourth character that joins Shinji and Asuka. I forgot her name, Mari or something, mm-hmm. but there's a fourth pilot introduced named Mari, a new character. Oh wow! So they're radic- they become radically different, and and it's crazy because in the third movie, what I heard is there's an anti nerve rebellion and uh, a sea lake force and all kinds of crazy shit. And it takes place in that post-apocalyptic wasteland that you saw in End of Evangelion. It was something similar to it. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I think that's something you might want to watch. Uh, yeah, it's 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 almost like uh, it's just like uh, almost like a reboot, it sounds like. And, and and the it is and the rumor is the fourth movie serves in the, as an ending to the rebuild films, but somehow also serves as an, an alternate ending to the original TV series. Which I don't know how the fuck that's going to work, but oh, wow. it's Evangelion. Yeah, yeah. And there's something interesting too because um, Karu in the in the films he it's it, it references that there's a there's been hints that the alternate reality of the of the TV series is linked to the movies because Karu, he wake gets up and he goes, you've never changed, Shinji. You have never changed. Relating to his first encounter with him in the TV series. That's all he's been hinted at in the films. Oh, wow. So I, I think I'm blowing your mind more so than I should say. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's Evangelion. <laughs> it's, it is one well, of those shows that people have always said that, like, it... it it screws up your head. You're like, wow. And you watch it and you're like, okay, well, yeah, yeah, I get, I get what you're saying now. I've always hated the term when people introduce people to beginner anime. I hate that term because what is a beginner anime? Everyone has different tastes. Anime is not just one genre of things. It's a, it's a medium. It's a I, medium. I, it's I not agree. a genre. I agree because yeah, there are so many people that w- they will tell me, "Oh, I hate anime," and they only describe like an anime show, like maybe like Yu Gi Oh or Pokemon. And I'm like, "That's that's not all of anime." I mean, I I look at it this way. I think everyone likes anime. They just have not found the anime that they like. They have not found the show they like. I... Uh, a great example. Great example would be like, uh, okay, my girlfriend, she doesn't really care for like, say, Dragon Ball Z, like, like it, right. it's it's boring to her. But we watched uh, One Up Girl on Netflix, and she absolutely loved it. Here's the thing: they're both that's anime. a good show. Yeah, they're both anime, but they both have different aspects. I think that's that. so. I think when I talk to people and they're like, "Oh, I, I hate that anime stuff, that Japanese stuff," they is is very ignorant. I've shown people who hate anime. Like, I have a friend in school who's very much into science fiction, but he's like, ah, anime doesn't seem it. I showed him Akira. I said, you like science fiction, though? I'll show you some good science fiction, hard science fiction anime. My favorite movie of all time is Akira. It's not because it's an anime. It's just because that movie's always had an impact. I fucking adore that movie. And I showed him Akira. I said, watch Akira, watch Ghost in the Shell. You know, watch, um, if you want more psychological shit, watch Blue... um, Watch Perfect Blue. Yeah. I mean, watch Paprika. Watch stuff like that, and you'll see. And he watched those films, and he was like, holy shit, dude, you were right. Anime's not just like, you know, school kids and shit like that. You know? Um, and it's it's not a genre. I will say that. It's a medium. Yeah. It is a fucking medium. And that's what it is. Now, now, did you ever... Because did, there's... I was like, did you ever hear... Go ahead. How, I was like, did you ever hear how anime became a thing to begin with? It was all because of World War Two, because yeah. the the film industry was was destroyed 
during World War II after after the war, and then making movies were so expensive, but it, it was a lot cheaper to make animation, and that's why animation exactly. became such a bigger thing in, in in Japan. And what's funny is a lot of anime is some of the earliest serialized shows on television anime was serialized decades before this golden age of tv that we have in the united states yeah. so-called golden age where you know everyone wants to watch serialized stories and i mean you know if you look back at the history of serialized shows in the united states there was a few the most groundbreaking show is one of my favorite shows is babylon 5 we'll talk mm -hmm. about that another time but but before that, if you look at shows like Votums and Gundam, Votums is 1983. It's as old as I am. I'm 36. You know, so Votums is 1983 when they didn't really have anything serialized except for maybe uh, what's that show called Street Blue Hill or Hill Street Blues or something like that it was a cop show that was heavily ser ser serialized here in the States. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you know, they had Gundam, they had Gatcha Man, they had all of these shows that had a beginning, middle, end. Matt Cross, you even brought it up. Matt Cross is from 81. Yeah. Robotech, the original Matt Cross, which is one of my favorites as well, that was heavy serialized. So I think when people say they don't, they hate anime, you got to give it props for being one of the first mediums to serialize something. I Another thing, too, is if if you talk to anybody who says they don't like anime, but they love Transformers, just smack them in the back of the head. Oh, my God. <laughs> I love yeah. it. People will be like, oh, man, I grew up watching Transformers, and then you talk about anime. Ew, anime. I'm like, dude, you're watching anime. <laughs> oh, you want to know the real kicker? You want to know the real kicker? Someone, I've met people who hate anime, but they love Robotech. That's even more of a sin. Oh, wow. Or, Vol or, Vol it. or Voltron. That's even more of a sin. Yeah. Oh, I got to talk about the original Japanese. Anyway, let's go back to Evangelion. Yeah. My yeah. point was, I wouldn't rec. I hate the term no beginner anime because, like I said, you ask someone like my friend, I showed him science fiction things. That's what he liked. I don't know if I would. I I love Evangelion, but it's not something I openly recommend to people. I even like tr tr had a talk with you about it. If you yeah. were sure you wanted to do this, and I because I thought it was a cool idea, and you're like, fuck it, I'll do it. But it's not something like I go, yeah, you have to see Evangelion because I get why people don't like it. And I'm sure you see that as well, right? Yeah. I mean, because it's a lot to soak in. And yeah, it's one of those shows that I have to say that I had to binge watch it because I couldn't imagine watching this show weekly. Like if it was like a weekly, like say it was on like Toonami or something like that. And I was a kid back in school and it was something I watched like every Monday at four o'clock. I couldn't imagine watching a show like that because there's so much to soak in. Cartoon Network did air Evangelion. That's so crazy. At one point. It was on a Adult Swim, though. Yeah. But even then it was edited. So, um, yeah, but that's the, the, the thing with this show. My viewing on it, I'm going to tell you this. I watched it. I don't watch it often. I do want to watch it again, and I'll probably put it on the shelf after I watch the rebuild for until like the next rebuild film comes out. So that's a good year and a half or so. But I'm going to tell you this, Xander. It hit me hard this time. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it hit me hard because the first time I watched it, it was like that cool, that set. Like you're watching something edgy as a 17 year old, right? Right, yeah. Then I watched it a few years later. I was like, oh, this is kind of fucked up, but it's cool, you know? And it was kind of like, oh, maybe it's a little overrated phase, right? Right. Then I watched it for my YouTube channel. I'm like, oh, this is still pretty good. It's in my top five. I watch it now as someone who's gone through, and I'm not saying I'm a better critic than people, but I see things differently. I'm a creative writing and lit major and a lit minor. So I see things differently because of that. Okay, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen the show in almost a decade before this Netflix view. I'm a parent to a teenager. I know the and I know the mental trauma a teenager goes through without all the shit Shinji goes through. I know yeah. someone close to my life that is exactly almost exactly like Shinji yeah. in a lot of ways. But doesn't have the hardship because I'm not a dick to him, okay? But is a like a lock that they will do what someone tells them to do. They will flee from fighting. They will do that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So there's that. It hit me hard because you really think about some of the things. Let's be honest. Asuka and Ray, they get raped. Yeah. They do. They get raped, dude. 
It's yeah. not that simple. They get they get raped. I mean, Oscar with the mind rape, and even there's those flashes that says, "Get out of my mind! How you're making me feel dirty." Yeah. And then there's that there's that ugly scene of Oscar in the house, the deserted house, naked, and she's just destroyed because she's a very she's a bitch. She's a confident bitch in the whole series. I hate to say it that way, but she is right. Right. Yeah. And the problem with that is when she is violated, it destroys her. What did you think of that scene when she got violated, mind rape? That, that, yeah, that was just kind of like, wow. Because, I mean, it pretty much took her spirit away. Mm -hmm. And then when that Ray clone dies, the one that gets to know Shinji, remember that? That, Ev that angel is violating her Eva. And remember, she's getting all the veins and shit. Mm -hmm. So she's getting violated in the same in the same way. So that's a metaphor for rape and trauma that it causes. Yeah, I mean it's a, it becomes if you really like back then like the mind rape task, it's like oh that screwed her up. But now it's like really like knowing what I know, it's like wow that's fucked up. It took it to do took, to end it. I'll say it took what little bit of innocence she had as a teenager away. Exactly. That that was that was already that 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 wasn't a whole lot to begin with because you know she's a teenager, and and she's piloting this big robot and trying to save the world and that's a, that's a big hardship on a teenager anyway. So you're thinking about that and then you're thinking about well you know what confidence she had because that was something that she she had throughout the show. She had a lot of comfort confidence, but it was kind of a visage within itself when you find out a little bit more of her backstory. It's kind of. Uh, oh. What were you gonna say? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Oh, I was just gonna say. It was like you the know. Classic... I want you to continue. Oh, sorry. Yeah, what? go ahead, and then I'll say what I want to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. say I, no, it's it's. Go ahead. Yeah, I was I was gonna say it's it's kind of like she was the classic bully syndrome. Yeah. That, that, that that's that's the the meat and potatoes of it. She was the classic bully syndrome, and and what she went through, what that little bit of confidence she had, what that little bit of humanity she had left was gone. And and even her as confident as she came across her sexuality was tested. Her attraction to Kaji. And I and I did tell you one question not to ask me was who killed Kaji, by the way. Because they never explained that. Yeah. Maybe they will yeah, the rebuild. Really, <laughs> I don't I don't know what his stat I don't remember what his status. It's been years since I seen the second rebuild. So I don't remember what his status is in I know he's in them, but I don't remember what his status is. But yeah, in this one it's just it, that even at that, that, like the with, with Kaji, he's the one more. He's the most mentally stable character in that series, and they kill him off. Yeah, think about that. They kill off the one character that is mentally stable, and it seems like he was expecting his death. Yeah. What I, what I was going to ask you, Xander, and if you can, and you can edit this out if you want, but do you want to go a little longer on this discussion? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, let's go a little longer than normal on this episode. Okay, you guys got a longer episode, I guess, because <laughs> there's a lot to digest. But what did you think of the character of Kaji? I, I, I it's very, very interesting. Very interesting, because like I said, he kind of, he kind of opened up another side of um, Shinji a little bit, you know. And Masato. Yeah. Because. Up until a good part of the series, Masato was very much one of the, um, a very emotional, stable character. But then later on, she does not. I mean, one of the most interesting scenes in that series is the scene where, and this is something that you don't see in anime a lot, is the is them in bed together. Remember? Yeah. Yeah, and that whole scene, you know, kind of broke down her vulnerabilities and why she was attracted to Kaji. But his the one thing that's heartbreaking about that is his last voice message where he says, if I see you again, I'll say the one thing that I could not say eight years ago or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So, and she knows she's dead. You know, there's a theory, and I don't buy it, but there's been a theory that's been going around that they say Masato is the one that killed Kaji. That would be interesting. I don't know. I I never bought that theory though. Yeah, I think I I liked his character though because he was kind of the 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 sane instrument 
of all the crazy stuff that was going on though. He he always seemed to be the one that always had um, the right stuff to say, and he kind of kept people grounded. That's that's one of the things I did like about him, especially in the yeah. in the in the in the early uh, introduction of him. You know, it was yeah. pretty, it was pretty it was much kinda... it was pretty much like he was just like the 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 guy, the cool guy that you know the younger girls like, and he had that little bit of history with with uh with homegirl and, and stuff like that. I mean, but yeah. Yeah, he was an int- Okay, let's run down characters then real quick. Let's go. What was that? What do you let's run down some characters real quick. Ritsuko. That what was, was your thoughts on her? I probably the closest that Sin uh Shinji had to a mother. You really think so? She was fucked up too in her own way. She was. She was, but I mean like I, it was almost like like that was the close. It was some of the closest he had to a, like a family member in so many ways. Because I mean, like you know, she looked after him, and even though he kind of resented, oh, her, you're mis- you're thinking of Misato. Ah, oh, shit. I'm talking about the scientist Ritsko. Oh, the her? blonde hair. Yeah, I mean, yeah, she was kind of fucked up. She was very robotic to me. But that was the point of that character too, though. Yeah. Because she she even says uh. She was afraid of relationships because a relationship between men and women could never be robotic. But then one of the I, I, one of the revelations that hit me hard was her relationship with Gendo when it was revealed that she was sleeping with him. Yeah. And how I can kind of get why she was sleeping with him because he was emotionally detached, but she expected more from him in the end. And that's where her logic threw out. Yeah, was thrown out the window, and like really, when you see her break down, like the Ray clones, when she destroys the Ray clones, she, the Ray clones were based off of Yui, Shinji's mom, right? And that's why her and her mom hated the 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 Ray clones because the because Gendo, as much of a dick as he was, he always loved Yui more than anyone else, no matter who else. So the Ray clones. He cared more for the Ray clones more so than he did for um, Ritsuko, and that's why she destroyed them, which is a fucked up scene when she destroys the clones. Yeah, and it's kind of funny when you first watch the show, you think he's just looking after Ray because, uh, you know, she's just an injured pilot. Mm hmm. Because he's like, you know, wanting and, to make sure she's okay, but then you find out it's like, oh, because of that. And I bet you were kind of confused when Ritsuko's mom killed the little child Ray. Yeah. I remember I was confused. I was like, Ray's still alive. But then when you see the clones, you're like, oh, she killed one of the Ray clones. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's what happened. So I don't know. I don't know. That, that, that shows such a mindfuck. Okay, let me run down two more characters, okay? All right. What, what did you think of... He doesn't get a lot of development, but when he does, it's pretty significant. Futsuke, uh, the second in command of Nerve. I, you know, I thought there was gonna be more to him than than there was. Like I thought, like I don't know, it made it. Sometimes it made it sound like, uh, like, like as if uh, he was. I'm trying to think of the best way to describe this because it almost seemed like at first that Shinji's dad was like. A, like almost like he was a puppet at at one point, and it was I almost thought like that guy was going to be like the the puppeteer that was actually pulling everything, and everything's going to turn around when I was first watching the show. But yeah, he doesn't really have a whole lot. Well, he hates there. Gendo. Yeah, but works for him. That's the ironic part. He hates him because he stole Yui away from him. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Let's see. So even he has a little bit of depth. Uh. Who else could we go to? What did you think of um, of Misato? Because we've mentioned her a lot, but we haven't really gone into your thoughts about her. I I really you, know, you kind of did already. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I really I really liked her. Did. Character. Go ahead and expand on this. I, I really liked her character because it, she was really trying to get Shinji out of his shell. Like she even mentioned mm-hmm. like the the hedgehog syndrome. Like she understood him, even though she was messed up in her own head with certain things. Uh, you know, failed love life, uh, what happened during the second impact. 
but she, like I said, she was the closest to uh, like a big sister, mother kind of figure that he had. And I remember she felt how happy she felt when he had friends, like when he was getting right. friends. And when she and when he was getting kind of cocky, she was actually kind of glad that he was getting cocky a little bit. Mm hmm. I remember that. And uh, yeah. Or, 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 you know, a scene is, is always is kind of heartbreaking is she's dragging him in the end of Evangelion because he's so broken. Yeah. Yeah. He's he's she's just dragging him. And then um, she the way the what the only weird thing is that last line she tells Shinji before she dies. She kisses him and she goes, we'll do the things that grown ups do. Yeah. <laughs> Which is weird, but I don't know if she was just. But I think she said that because she knew she was dead. Yeah. Um. Okay. Real quick, because I know we should. Pro we did go over, right? We've gone yeah, over. Yeah, yeah, we've gone over a little bit. Okay. But yeah. Let's. Okay. Um. The last scene, the very last scene of End of Evangelion. The uh the choking. Yeah, the choking, the beach scene. Yeah, that was uh. That 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 was kind of messed up. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's so why uh, why because that's another thing we were talking about translations earlier, and that line she says in Japanese has been translated to "I'm sick," "I feel disgusted," or something. In this translation, it's just disgusting, right? Yeah. But there's been times when it says "I feel sick," or there's just been different. And that can be interpreted. Some people have thought she's pregnant. Some people have thought, you know, um, the way it is. I think what it is is Shinji's choking her, but then he, she, he stops when she caresses him. And she says she's disgusting, and I she feels disgusting. And I think she says I. it's her way of saying I love this little fucker, but I feel, it makes me ill. Yeah. Because of I think that's... I think that's what ultimately happens. It's not a hookup necessarily, but it's a realization of their own fucked up sexuality and feeling. Because Asuka's sexuality is just as fucked up too in a different way, which yeah. we haven't really talked about. Her attraction to Kaji in a lot of animes that would be treated as like a humorous thing, but it's actually like when you get deep in the series, it actually br leads to her breakdown. Yeah. Yeah, she becomes obsessed so, with them. Yeah, she becomes obsessed and he does the right thing. I just, you're a kid. You're a kid. So, one last thing, too, Xander. The uh, episodes 21, I think I told you this in text, 21 through 24 are the director's cut episodes. Yeah, I remember which, you were mentioning You probably that, yeah. noticed they're longer. Yeah. Yeah, if you notice, those episodes are longer. And in my old DVD set, which was stolen, it had both the original version of 21 through 24 and the original version and the director's cut. And the director's cut opens of 21 because it's a flashback. It doesn't have that scene of the of the second impact happening in the original version. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we kind of overwhelmed ourselves this episode because there's still a lot more to talk about. <laughs> it really is. But, hey, this is where folks that are listening can go in the comments and we can all talk about it, too. This leads a good uh, yeah. This leads some good um, uh, audience interaction. I think there's going to be some that disagree with my sentiments on the on the dub. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I Did some some people some people have completely disowned the new the new uh, dub just because it doesn't have "Fly Me to the Moon" at the end of it. Some people are just like, "Oh, I'm so disappointed." It's like just look up the song on YouTube. <laughs> and you know what, too, Xander? Hmm. They have a German dub. They have the Japanese dub. They have they have the original. The Japanese dub's never been changed because I, I I watched some of the Japanese dub and I used to just watch the Japanese dub. Not to say, I like dubs. Don't get me wrong, but I like I said I never liked that English the old dub of Evangelion. So I always watched it and I and I remember it because I watched it so much, right? Yeah. And I listened to it and it's just it. Like the new dub was refreshing to watch because it was lines that were so different. But watching the Japanese dub hit me with nostalgia. Yeah. Because I had to watch it so much. So I knew that was the original dub. Yeah. So hopefully we can get you to watch the rebuild films. And you you had one more thing to say, I think, about uh, Shin Godzilla. Yeah, yeah, because 
I admit, when I watch Shin Godzilla, of course, it's by the same director of Even Evangelion. When I when I watched it in theaters. Because uh, it was in theaters one day, and I watched it. I didn't particularly care for it because it was a very drawn-out political drama. Most of the movie takes place in the office, and it takes place with the characters on there. You know, a lot of people complain about Godzilla 2014 and King of Monsters being like, there's too much humans, there's not enough monsters. Watch Shin Godzilla and come back to me. Because there's not a whole lot of Godzilla, but when they do show Godzilla, he's almost a... He almost interprets... The, the disturbing aspect of mankind and the corrupt of of politics because he starts off he starts off like he's got three different forms in the in the mm -hmm. movie and he starts off as kind of like a nuisance and then he turns into Godzilla and I watching the this show and then thinking about the first scene of Godzilla's atomic breath it all clicked I'm like oh okay. Okay, well, this this kind of makes more sense because this was Shin Godzilla is more of a emotional journey than it is a monster film. And that yeah, and now that you watched it, um, if you want to watch some other works from Anno though, mm -hmm. um, and the the one work that I'm going to recommend, and Bio Phoenix would be totally uh, our friend Bio Phoenix would totally agree with me on this, is uh, um, and it's not it's got more of a it's got a bittersweet ending. It still has some of the psychological ramification, but not as fucked up as as Evangelion. Watch Gunbuster. Ah. Uh. Yeah, watch Gunbuster. Aim to the top because that's a really good anime. It's a little bit silly at times because there are scenes where the girls are naked in bathtubs or something or in hot tubs, and they just they just talk, and there's a lot of breast movement. Yeah, which is fan servicey. But other than that, that movie is very, it's it's very heartfelt and it's it's got a lot of warmth to it. But you can see shades of Evangelion. The other work people talk about with him is Nadia, Secret of the Blue Water or something. But uh -huh. that had production issues too, which I won't even go into because it's even more messed up. I've never seen Nadia though of the Blue Water. Yeah. So that's that's if you want to watch another Ano anime, I would recommend. Uh, Gunbuster, and don't worry, it's not as heavy as as Evangelion, but it's good. I mean, it's deep, but it's not like overwhelming like you felt with Evangelion. Yeah, it was like I said, it was very, very overwhelming show. Like I said, I'm gonna have to watch it again later uh, <laughs> once my once my mind kind of stabilizes. I'm like, all right, it's time to go back on this roller coaster because that's really what it was. It was you're, a roller coaster. It you're processing it. Yeah, because it was it was a show that starts off like a stereotypical uh, monster versus robots thing, and it, it, that's the thing. A lot of Japanese mech animes are not all about robots battling giant monsters. There's always more to it, like uh, like you know, like Gundam, uh, Matt Cross. There's 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 more to it than just robot fights. It's 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 not Super Sentai or Power Rangers. And but, you know what? It was it, it, it's more of a real quick. You you brought up a good point. It's more of a. It may even be more of a deconstruction of Power Rangers or Sentai or whatever. Yeah. If you really think about it, than actual mecha anime because mecha anime is really really deep. I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt you. I'm just saying. No, 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 it makes a good because because beginning the first couple episodes it was just like every episode like oh we got to fight another angel. And let's fight an angel, you know, let's do this, let's do that. And you're just kind of like, oh, okay, cool, cool. And then, you know, you get a little bit more character development. You get a little bit more of a backstory. You kind of figure out what the world's coming to, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, it becomes, you know, crazy. Very, very crazy. Indeed, indeed. Did you like it, Xander? That's the last question. I, I, I did. I did really like it. And I'm glad I finally got to see it. And... um I I definitely want to dive more into it. Yeah, I, we I, shall. I, I liked it. We we got a lot of follow up episodes to do, <laughs> but I think this is one we should prioritize down the line. Not for a while, because we have some. We have a fun episode next week, I think. Oh yeah, not, not as uh, not as in. I don't think it's gonna be as much of an in depth episode as this one was, but it's gonna be a lot of fun. A lot yeah, of fun. yeah, yeah. It'll be pretty cool. Um, but yeah, uh, any last words? Go watch it, guys.
<laughs> Go watch it on Netflix. <laughs> and if you don't like it, that's okay. We understand it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not for everyone. Yeah, I'll, yeah, it's I'll, really def not. I'll definitely admit that it's not for everyone, and but it's good. I liked it personally. It was it was a good show. One, la one last thing: if you want more, if it did lead to a deconstruction of other anime genres, like one of my favorites is a, a show called Revolutionary Girl Yutna. You know how I guess Evangelion is a deconstruction of the mecha genre. Yeah. Yutna is fucked up in its own way, but it's the deconstruction of the magical girl genre. Ah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I like Magical Girl Yutna. Or Revolutionary Girl Yutna. Um, that one's really good. And then there's the other one, Serial Experiments Lane, which is, I don't think it deconstructs anything, but it's 13 episodes of mindfuckery. <laughs> and it, and it, it's not like Eva where it starts off like, yeah, we're going to do this. No, it starts off off the boat as fucked up as Eva got in the end. So there you go. I, so another, if you want to watch two fucked up ones, watch those two. I will say, I will say also, uh, let, let's let's add an extra one in there. I don't know if you've watched it or not, but um, if you want to watch another very weird psychological anime that that's that's kind of kind of like in the same premises in some ways, uh, Gantz. Oh, okay. Yeah, Gantz. Um, okay, I'm I'm down with Gantz. I've read the manga, some of it, and I liked it, but it's fucked up. It is. It starts off kind of like, you know, bad people get second chances and kill aliens, but then there's more to it. A lot more yeah. to it. <laughs> uh, I got I got one more, too. Another anime that I watched it right before, and I'm a fan of it. A lot of people dismiss it as an Evangelion clone. It isn't, but it deals with some psychological themes, and it does get heavy in its own way, but it's not as disturbing. It's called Razafon. All right. And I think that's one I would really like you to watch as soon as possible. Razafon is available on Amazon Prime. It is about it, it's it's about a boy who gets a magical mech called the Razafon, and he fights against these things called Dolems. But what the show is about, where I guess you can call Evangelion more of an exploration of the depression. It does the same thing as Evangelion does, but with the concepts of time. And what we do with the time that is met with us and explores those themes very deeply. Hmm. But it's not as bleak as yeah. Evangelion, but it's still as deep as. Because the ending to that one is more bittersweet than, you know, Shinji strangling someone on a beach. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to check it out. So. But so. yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're, we're running close to time. We went a little over, but uh, <laughs> I think we're going to wrap it up. And uh, I want to thank everyone for, for listening. And be sure to leave some comments. I'd love to, as, as a new fan of the series, I'd love to talk to some more uh, folks that are fans like Anthony and, and veterans and kind of get kind of get my feet in the water with this, man. <laughs> I feel like it's, it, it, it's a very big learning process show, but I, I really did enjoy it. And uh, when we come back, we're going to be doing a really interesting episode on a very interesting uh, crossover movie and mm -hmm. that's all i want to say about that it's gonna be absolutely tubular anyway guys as always thanks for listening and we'll be blasting off to the next episode <laughs>